I'm Christina and welcome to Code Stories. I actually met our guest, Dr. Sarah Kaiser, in I think the most pandemic way possible. We met playing Animal Crossing. Sarah is one of the coolest people I've ever met. Uh, she does so much great stuff and now we're going to go and we're going to talk with her. Hey, Sarah. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Give our viewers uh, your name, uh, what you do, and your background. So my name is Dr. Sarah Kaiser. Um, I'm a quantum computing technologist, open source developer, <laughs> and now I'm really excited about being able to contribute to the open source community and doing community management there. And you have a PhD in quantum physics, right? That's right. All right, so this might be a dumb question, but I bet it's one a lot of people have. What is quantum computing? We're kind of familiar with this model of like having a specialized hardware device that, you know, performs and speeds up certain types of tasks, but like, you know, you can't run everything in your computer on a GPU, or I guess maybe you can, but it's not advisable. <laughs> like, uh, checking my email on my graphics card is not going to help. But rendering graphics for videos or for video games, like, definitely it's for 100%. Yeah. So uh, quantum computing is similarly a hardware accelerator. So it doesn't necessarily universally speed up everything. It's not going to replace everything. And in fact, critically relies on classical computers. So, you know, don't, <laughs> don't get rid of your regular computer yet. <laughs> but what's interesting is for things like graphics cards, we know exactly what box of problems we should say, all right, if it's highly parallelizable, we know that's something we send off to the graphics card. For quantum computers, we don't really have the boundaries of that. <laughs> kind of these are the problems that make sense for this. Uh, we have good examples of points in that box, but we're really kind of trying to explore what that boundary actually looks like. And, and really the best way to do it at this point is to have the hardware, have the tools, have the software, and just mess around a little bit. <laughs> and so that's, um, that's basically one of the things that um, I work on on stream and with the Q Sharp community is we're just going around and implementing stuff just to kind of see what happens, see if we find, find ways to kind of leverage the language. So, that brings us to Q Sharp. Q Sharp is a domain specific language for quantum computing. So just like you have languages specifically for graphics cards like CUDA, mm -hmm. you have languages for FPGAs, Q Sharp is a language for quantum computers. The reason you want uh, or why it's helpful to have a new language as opposed to using something like Python is it's designed around what the hardware can and can't do. <laughs> so, you know, we wouldn't really be getting a lot of advantage if our quantum hardware behaved exactly like our classical hardware, then it's just really, really expensive classical hardware. <laughs> right. <laughs> so Q Sharp has a lot of features and design kind of um, principles that make it feel like it's a natural way to describe what you want to do on that hardware. And it's open source. There's a ton of libraries already available. So like there are things implemented in there like quantum machine learning that you can just literally open, open the namespace and, and use. So from what I understand, you are the only Q Sharp MVP. And for, for the audience, that is the Microsoft uh, Valuable Professional Program. So talk to us a little bit about your journey, about how you became as far as we know, the only Q Sharp MVP. You know, I, I saw that there was a lot of open source quantum software projects that were kind of popping up. Some were in Python and, and I found Q Sharp. It seemed like a really well designed and something that would be useful to me, uh, you know, trying to write code for quantum computers. Normally I'd been writing code that was closer to the actual hardware level, but I started playing around with Q Sharp and then really saw that it had had a lot of value in this area and so then I started doing research projects uh, with with colleagues and, and teaching people how to use it and uh, ended up applying for the MVP program. So how long have you been working with Q Sharp at this point? Basically since it launched. <laughs> it's still a it's still a pre 1.0 language you know I am always eager for the monthly release notes and you know try to make like rundowns of them to kind of see what is actually and and I've made feature requests and had them accepted and it's it's really was really exciting to me right now about like temporally about quantum computing and this technology in general is that I have the opportunity to actually participate in its development. You know, like I, I really love hearing about like the 50s and 60s when we were developing kind of the, the first rounds of classical computing technology. And this, this kind of yeah. feels like an equivalent time period for a new technology. Like we're that early on taking research papers and research algorithms and writing them in Q Sharp because no one's done it before. 
I love using Q Sharp and I think it's a really unique kind of take on, in the space of kind of trying to focus on this, focus on a pretty high level uh, language. So there's not a lot of stuff specific to the hardware that you're running on. Programming and thinking about uh, what you're doing at the algorithmic level, which is basically what we need to figure out right now to figure out the boundaries of that box of the types of problems that we want to put on the, run on the quantum computer. What is good about the hardware that we have is it allows us to characterize it and kind of learn things about the noise on the devices and really learn a lot more about the physics. And that's kind of like where the science, uh, there's a lot of science involved in this. But where this really pairs well with industry and why seeing companies like Microsoft getting into this is cool is because they have the technical expertise to like do the signal processing and build custom hardware you know that academics usually either don't have the skill or funding to do so and so you actually can make progress <laughs> like often as an academic we were kind of stymied by either budget or just you know we didn't have you had a bunch of grad students trying to figure out this task that you know there's commercially available devices to do it, or you know you have to re-implement everything from scratch. So these partnerships can be really, really productive. I think. Yeah, no, for sure. And and I want to I want to I want to touch on that a little bit more because I think this is so interesting, especially for someone like you who has the background in both industry and in in the science part. Why is it important that those two work together, especially when we're talking about something like quantum that is still in the development phase and and is is you know still evolving? Academics, you know, generally, even speaking of like, I have very deep knowledge in a fairly narrow area of, you know, quantum technology, um, given the, the breadth of what's out there. And that kind of makes it hard uh, to when you're trying to build up the stack that has so many different types of technology in it. There's, you know, your actual qubits that you're building, so that's great. But then you have like low temperature physics and cryogenics that you need to keep it cold. Then you need to figure out how to get electrical signals through that. Then you need all of the FPGAs and processing to handle that. And then like that all eventually translates up to an Azure instance <laughs> that you can, you know, just ping from your desktop at the coffee shop. There is so many different skills included in that in that stack. And collaborations in academia are really great, but it's kind of hard to get that sort of breadth of skills involved. And so like working on industry teams where, uh, you know, they have like hardware device groups and stuff that are working on everything in that entire spectrum, you know, they can walk up and say, you know, academics can say, oh, here's where we're stuck. We need this plug to go to this widget. And then everybody's like, okay, cool, we got that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, everybody gets unblocked in, in that way. So the scope of what we're trying to do here is just so large, it's not, it's not tenable for any kind of one party to be able, or even small number of parties to really do it themselves, <laughs> which is really exciting. So where are we both like as Microsoft and within society, within kind of the state of quantum and kind of creating something that's, I don't know, like more fungible? <laughs> Yeah, as always, you know, what people call fungible is, is fungible itself. But, <laughs> <laughs> and, and truly that is where most of the, the drama and discussion is happening right now is how do we define what is, what is the end goal here? But in terms of kind of where we're at, I, I think we're kind of at two different places, one with hardware and one with software. So like we have stuff that works, you know, really great in kind of like small numbers. You know, we have maybe a couple tens, twenties, fifty qubits, things like that. You know, we need, much, many orders of magnitude more qubits than that to do things potentially, uh, you know, like people talk about Shor's algorithm, like that's kind of one of the holy grail sort of things that people want to do. That's going to take a lot more qubits. What, what, what is Shor's algorithm? So Shor's algorithm is, is an algorithm that we know that we can factor large integers on a quantum computer faster than any known classical algorithm. Right. Okay. So, so if I'm understanding this correctly, you could basically have a situation where if Shor's algorithm could be run, it could break any crypto that it basically exists right now. What you're saying is you could also re reverse engineer that and say, okay, but if we build our security infrastructure systems using this, then that mm -hmm. would make it that much more difficult to try to break those locks. Yeah, that's exactly right. Talk to me about how you make quantum approachable and why it's important uh, to do that. Making quantum computing is accessible is, I think, really important. You know, it was really challenging for me when I kind of first got into it because there wasn't a lot of good resources, or at least they're mostly geared at grad students, so okay. But now that we can actually write quantum algorithms and write, in, write quantum programs, 
you know, in VS Code, in, in Visual Studio, with, you know, IntelliSense, with all of these sorts of things that, you know, this really feels like this should be something accessible to kind of your everyday developers. And so, you know, finding ways to help people either understand the, the devices well enough that they can write code for them. Like, I certainly don't understand the internals of how a, a graphics card works, but I can, you know, look at the documentation for a package and I can spin it up and probably figure out how to use it. So I, I am always trying to encourage people to kind of take that similar approach to quantum. <laughs> like, you know, just pip install or whatever, <laughs> install the software and just try it out. So um, you don't, there is not this, I feel like there is a strong, Kind of prevailing opinion that you have to understand all of the physics to be able to understand quantum computing and while obviously that would help i don't think it's strictly necessary and i think you can still do some really cool stuff just kind of <laughs> what i like to call programming experimentally <laughs> where you just kind of plug it in and start changing stuff and see what happens hi everyone and nice to virtually meet you my name is Dr. Sarah Kaiser, and I love quantum technologies. You also do live streams, and you teach people how to do stuff. Why, why do you teach this? Why is this something that you think is important to bring other people into? Yeah, I, I think you know, quantum computing has the, the potential to be a really transformative technology like for society. And I want to make sure that, you know, like quantum computing or machine learning or you know, any of these really kind of high-tech fields, that everyone can be included. And that really starts with making sure that everyone is included when we're like teaching it. Being aggressive about that, I think, is is really important to make sure that you know everyone can have a seat at the table when we need to make important decisions about this technology. You know, if we start with that inclusiveness now, then potentially you know more people will be interested, give their perspectives, and and we might even be able to solve problems we didn't even consider without that sort of input. Exactly. Like, if we want to find the boundaries of that box of the problems that we can solve with this, we need as many perspectives as possible. And being inclusive about that, I think, is, is our, our best chance. Well, we just finished talking to Dr. Sarah Kaiser, and she's incredible. Her story is amazing. I love learning from her. And you definitely want to tune into the next episode because we're going to dive into the code. And Sarah's actually going to show us how you can program with quantum computing and Q Sharp. And it's going to be awesome, so be sure to check it out.